powerful earthquake hits central Italy. Dozens are dead as rescue teams search through the rubble to free and treat survivors. Samburu and Maasai communities in Kenya find alternatives to female genital mutilation. And could this robot bring children with long-term illnesses out of isolation? Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCorry. This is Africa 54. We'll have those stories shortly. But first, the Associated Press is reporting that the president of the American University in Kabul, Afghanistan, says the school is under attack by militants. Mark English told AP that security forces are on the scene and university officials are trying to assess the situation. Witnesses say they heard explosions and automatic gunfire, and eyewitness told VOA that they have seen Afghan special forces rushing towards the scene shortly after the first explosion. There are no details of casualties or claims of responsibility from militant groups. Uh, for continuous updates, visit voanews.com. Now, a violent earthquake struck central Italy early Wednesday, killing at least 73 people. That is according to Italy's Civil Protection Agency and media reports. The quake hit at 3.30 a.m. local time, causing extensive damage, reducing many buildings near the epicenter to rubble. The U.S. Geological Survey put the magnitude at 6.2 with uh, an epicenter about 10 kilometers southeast of the town of Nosir. Uh, the shaking was felt across a large part of the region, including the capital Rome, 150 kilometers away. Multiple sh aftershocks uh, followed, further rattling one of the hardest hit areas of the town of Amatrice, Mayor Sergio. Uh, Pirozzi told state-run broadcaster Rai that a large portion of the town was destroyed. Now, search and rescue teams are continuing to work to try to reach those trapped in the ru ruins of collapsed buildings. For the latest on the quake, we go to Rome, where journalist uh, Josephine McKenna is standing by. Josephine, good evening. And first, uh, just give us an update on what's going on right now. It looks like uh, it was such a devastation for that region. Yes, Vincent, these towns in the centre of Italy uh, look like a war zone. Uh, we're seeing buildings that have been cut in two, the roofs being shorn off the uh, apartment buildings and the homes. Really shocking scenes of devastation. And rescue teams are still working into the night tonight to try and save people that they believe are trapped under the rubble. Uh, they're sifting with bulldozers, sniffer dogs, even their bare hands. Mountains of rubble, as you can imagine, and uh, scenes of incredible devastation in these towns. Amatrice has been very hard hit and uh, seems to be the town where most of the victims have uh, died. Around 35 at least have come from that town, but there are still many people unaccounted for. And it looks like, uh, you know, the response was uh, somewhat slow. Is it because of the time it happened or was it a question of accessibility? I think it was a question of both of those factors. The fact that it happened at 3.30 in the morning, uh, there was another uh, serious aftershock an hour later. But here in August, is, it's very much a vacation period and many people are away. And uh, I think it might have just taken a little while for people to get moving. And don't forget, these towns are fairly isolated hill towns. Uh, the roads are not major highways leading into these towns. So there would have been uh, some difficulties with access. Some of the roads and bridges were damaged leading into these villages. So that certainly didn't help the operation. But the Civil uh, Protection Department mobilised fairly quickly. Now there are hundreds of firefighters, emergency workers and volunteers working in these towns to try and beat the clock, if you like, and find out if there are people still alive. We're hearing people shouting for help beneath the rubble. So, uh, and they rescued someone just a short time ago. So there are indications that people are still alive down there. Now, is this a region that is um, in a kind of a zone that is susceptible to earthquakes or was this a, a surprise kind of earthquake? Well, Italy is a, a serious, uh, suffers, you know, as, as a, is a serious earthquake prone country. Right through the centre of the country is the Apennine mountain range. And that is a very serious quake zone. 
Uh, this particular area is very close, only about 60 kilometres away from L'Aquila, where the very serious earthquake occurred in 2009 and 300 people died there. Uh, the geologists, the senior geologists in Italy today were saying 24 million people in Italy live in a area or areas that have an elevated earthquake risk. So that gives you some idea. Uh, and those areas are dotted throughout the country. But this particular area is susceptible and has had earthquakes in the past. And very quickly, these are mostly very old buildings, right? These are uh, very, very old buildings in the area. There's a mix of old and modern. Uh, but you'll notice in, if you see vision in the town of Amatrice, there was a medieval tower that collapsed. Mm -hmm. Uh, or it's teetering, it's very fragile. And that gives you some indication of how old some of these buildings are. And they've, they've survived centuries, but they've collapsed under the strength of this earthquake. So that gives yeah. you an idea All of right. how serious it was. Okay, Josephine, thank you very much. Uh, uh, that Thanks, is a Susan. journalist, uh, Josephine McKenna, reporting live via Sky from Rome. Now, in Vatican City, Pope Francis, saddened by the earthquake that devastated central Italy, cancelled a speech he wants to have given to his general audience in St. Peter's Square and instead prayed with a crowd for victims and survivors. The pontiff said, quote, I cannot fail to voice my great pain and my closeness to all the people that are in the area hit by the earthquake and to all the people who have lost their loved ones and those who still feel moved by fear and terror. Pope Francis also said he was deeply saddened to hear the mayor of Amatrice say that the town no longer exists and that there are children among the victims. Now to a disaster in the United States, President Barack Obama is promising that aid will continue to flow to the flood-stricken people of Louisiana as long as it's needed to get them back on their feet. The president on Tuesday visited Baton Rouge and toured some of the homes that were hit by historic flooding earlier this month. He says federal support has reached $127 million to help 100,000 people who have applied for assistance. Viewers, Zlatica Hoek reports. President Obama arrived in Baton Rouge, where residents had set out household items to dry or be discarded. The unprecedented flooding has damaged about 60,000 homes in southern Louisiana, shocking residents who have never experienced a natural disaster of that proportion. My house was as nice as it's ever been. I'm losing it. And I'm sorry. I just can't take this. Obama assured residents that support will keep coming until people can return to their homes or rebuild their lives. This is not a one-off. This is not uh, a, a photo op issue. This is how do you make sure that a month from now, three months from now, six months from now, people still are getting the help that they need. I need all Americans to stay focused on this. The president was criticized for not interrupting his vacation on Martha's Vineyard to visit the flooded state, most notably by Republican presidential nominee Donald Trump, who visited Louisiana last week. Honestly, Obama ought to get off the golf course and get down there. Obama said he did not want to disrupt the emergency rescue efforts. Louisiana Governor Bell Edwards supported the president's decision, saying he could not spare the security personnel required for a presidential visit. He also expressed hope that Trump's visit was more than an attempt to attract voters' attention. But he later thanked the Republican candidate for drawing attention to the gravity of the disaster. Obama said that in times of tragedy, Washington tends to avoid politicking. I guarantee you, nobody on this block None of those first responders. Nobody gives a hoot whether you're a Democrat or a Republican. Uh, what they care about is making sure they're getting the, uh, the drywall out and the carpet out and there's not any mold building. They get some contractors in here and they start rebuilding as quick as possible. That's what they care about. That's what I care about. At least 13 people were killed by flooding, while some others are still missing. Zlatica Hoek, VOA News, Washington. Well, the Samburu and Maasai communities in Kenya are changing their long practice tradition of female genital cutting. They're giving up the procedure of circumcising girls as a rite of passage, beginning with one warrior who changed the perspective of the community through time and education. Many girls are going through an alternative ceremony that has taken its place. Uh, Tony Anulo has more. <laughs> The 
In a remote, deeply traditional corner of north central Kenya, hundreds of young Samburu girls wearing red and blue robes dance in the light of dawn. They sing. They worship. They praise. They are entering their adult lives through a new ceremony designed to back a traditional that has injured so many of their ancestors. The Samburu and Maasai, who have for centuries practiced female genital mutilation as a traditional rite of passage, as girls become women are now giving up the long-practiced tradition which locals call the cut. <laughs> Here, a schooling offers an alternative to female genital mutilation. Samuel Leadismo, a Samburu warrior, is leading the fight against female genital mutilation. I know that there is a need of me to help my community because there is, an, uh, there is cases of early marriages, female genital um, mutilation, uh, FG, FGMC, and also there is a dropout in schools. Leadismo, the director of Pastoralist Child Foundation, held meeting with men and women to educate them about dangers of circumcision, including transmission of disease, psychological trauma and complication during childbirth. And uh, that thing motivated me that, oh, I need to help my community because without me coming back and empower my community, I don't know who am I waiting to come back and help them. As a result, fewer girls are becoming married off as teenagers and more are going to school. 17-year-old Asha Liresh was the first girl in the community to reject being circumcised, asking her parents to allow her to finish school rather than be cut and married. At first, her parents worried it would bring shame to her family, and they received backlash from the community. I was supposed to undergo FGM, but thank, thanks be to God, I have not undergone that. Uh, there were some... There's, Good Samaritan that have helped me, that uh, it have helped me to escape that FGM. Lerish is now in grade 10 and desires to become a doctor when she finally pursues her education to university. In the new ceremony, girls between the age of 9 and 15 are taught life lessons, a brief introduction to sex education. Warriors show support for the alternative ceremony by offering ships and goats to feed the girls and the community. The ceremony takes four days. On the final day, the girls line up and sing traditional song. The ride ends with the girls walking through a ceremonial act formed by tribal elders as the surrounding community welcomes them as women. Sida no, no. Gareth from New Jersey in USA is also helping girls by teaching them facts about their bodies and myths of the female genital mutilation. She is also offering sponsorship to girls to access education. So we offer workshops for girls, 60 girls at a time, who attend four days together. And we teach them about teen pregnancy, HIV AIDS, self-awareness, self-confidence, FGM, obviously, uh, forced early marriage, the importance of formal education, and sexual and reproductive health. Kenyan's government finally outlawed female genital mutilation in 2011 and has already had an impact now Kenyan women aged between 45 to 49 are three times more likely to have had a procedure than those aged between 15 to 19, according to a recent United Nations report. Reporting for Voice of America in Samburu, Kenya, I am Tony Onyulo. Well, in business news, investors are selling shares of Nigerian banks on Wednesday, just one day after the Central Bank of Nigeria suspended nine lenders from foreign exchange transactions. For the details, Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino joins us live from New York. Hi, Jill. Hey, Vincent. So just because things are bad does not mean they can't get worse when it comes to economics in Nigeria. According to the Central Bank of Nigeria, the banks had failed to remit $2.1 million, billion, dollars, excuse me, which was the government's share of dividends from the state-owned gas company NLNG. The banks were supposed to pay the company into the government's account at the Central Bank, 
Last year, President Buhari ordered government payments to be made into one single central bank account as part of his pledge to fight corruption. Now, it seems like the Central Bank of Nigeria has made many, uh, or rather several, policy changes throughout this year, but it doesn't seem like it has helped the Naira, right? Right. Well, we tend to focus on Nigeria when discussing business and economics in Africa, as it is the continent's largest economy, even with the decline in the Naira. But it is now suffering its worst financial crisis in decades as a slump in oil revenue hammers public finances and the Naira. That is certainly lending to the decline in value of the currency, and the CBM believes a recession is likely. The bank floated the currency in June to attract investment, allowing the Naira to fall by 40 percent against the dollar. But foreign investors, they stayed away. They were on the sidelines. It actually didn't come to buy Naira. So it's making the central bank the main supplier of dollars. Trade remains thin and liquidity is tight on the foreign exchange market. And just like with stocks, thinner liquidity creates more volatility because price moves are more exaggerated. And ultimately, this gets passed on to the Nigerian consumer, uh, right? Right, because the majority of the basic goods sold in Nigeria are imported overseas. It's about 80 percent imported. Therefore, as the Naira continues to free fall, the wholesalers and retails of goods will have to adjust the prices of their products upwards to reflect the amount being paid for these goods since they are paid for in dollars. This is a basic definition of inflation. It also makes borrowing more difficult. Now, analysts at NKC African Economics expect this volatility to continue in the near term, but think the CBN's policy to float the Naira will eventually normalize in the latter part of 2017. The next near-term catalyst that I'm looking for is the Federal Reserve raising interest rates potentially in 2016. That would move the dollar higher against Naira, an increasing dollar could make Nigerian imports more expensive and further impact the Naira. So that's really what we're looking for next. We'll be watching. As always, thank you very much, uh, Jill, for your reporting. That's, that's Africa 54 business correspondent Jill Malandrino reporting live from New York. Now, want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we covered? Join the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. And check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, West African countries are trying to recover from the devastating impact of Ebola. Stay with us. To the wall. To the window. Health news and notes. This is Living Better. Many people suffer from muscle strains and joint pain. Doctors can treat the pain with infrared light therapy, but the devices are costly. The technology is now available to consumers in the United States with the government-approved Lumi Wave device. John Weston is CEO of the company that makes it, and he describes what it treats. Uh, strains, sprains, back pain, and arthritis. Now, it's not going to cure rheumatoid arthritis. It's going to help you maintain some of the pain. The low-level light releases a natural body chemical that increases blood flow and stimulates the lymphatic system reducing inflammation and pain. Andrew Pritikin is a doctor of physical therapy. It's easy, it's relatively safe, and if they can bring you know, the cost down, efficiency up, uh, it will be a common household item. Light therapy is non-invasive and the consumer treats the specific area of pain as needed. I'm Martin Seacrest for VOA's Living Better. <laughs> Welcome back. In a recent report, the International Fund for Agricultural Development says that many farmers in West Africa are still reeling from the impact of Ebola and urgently need help, or they could be forced to leave their farms to seek work elsewhere. Now, viewers, Jackson Vonganya has just returned from the region. During the epidemic, many farmers in Guinea, Sierra Leone and Liberia were unable to grow or sell their crops. That's because of measures to contain the virus, including travel restrictions, border closures, 
and quarantines as well as fear of infe infection. Now, for more on how the region is faring, we are pleased to have Jackson here in the studio with me. Welcome back, Jackson. Thank you, Vincent. So first, uh, you know, you were there some time back. Right. You, you, you just came back now after second visit. Right. Uh, I, I was there last yeah. year, mm -hmm. last October. Mm -hmm. Just came back now. I went back uh, yeah. about a couple of weeks ago and then just came back. So first, once you hit the ground, did you get the sense that things have changed? Absolutely. Things mm -hmm. are changing. There's uh, a spirit, yeah. uh, a very different spirit, a whole different attitude in the people. Yeah. I uh, feel like there's a hope. Yeah. Uh, in both communities that I traveled to. I went to Monrovia, then went to uh, Freetown in Sierra Leone. And, um, you know, shops are open. Yeah. People are going about their businesses. Schools are back, to, you know, students are back in school. Yeah. And, you know, like the report says, uh, agriculture was affected, but it, agriculture is not is one of the many sectors that were affected during mm -hmm. the, the, the epidemic. You know, yeah. education was affected. Schools were closed for many months. Yeah. Uh, healthcare, obviously. Yeah. Uh, was affected too. And, and right now we're looking at some footage of you visiting uh, a very critical place. There were so many deaths. Right. You went to a burial. That is uh, yeah. the St. Tom Cemetery yeah. in, uh, sorry, the King Tom Cemetery in uh, Freetown, Sierra Leone, yeah. where over 6,000 people were buried, uh -huh. uh, uh, victims of uh, Ebola. Yeah. And I spoke to young People, they call themselves the, the, the friends of the dead. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were working with, uh, so the, uh, during uh, Ebola, I remember yeah. that uh, there were a lot of reports of people contracting uh, Ebola because of touching uh, the, the dead. Of, yeah, and the so dead. the Red Cross concern and the government came together and, and formed teams, yeah. burial teams, where they would go into villages or homes and, 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 and get the people who have, uh, you know, who died because of Ebola and then mm -hmm. bury them and uh, 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 this King Tom Cemetery is one of the, the cemeteries. Yeah. Uh, these young men that I was talking to, that I, I was talking to in Freetown, were part of uh, Concern International. And they're courageous and they survived and we're happy to see them. Absolutely. Now absolutely. something else I, you, you discovered is that um, even some of those who survived uh, Ebola ended up having their lives under threat. Absolutely. Why? Absolutely. There's a lot of stigma that is going on for those who survived Ebola, this case of uh, this heartbreaking case of this one woman that I, I, I visited in, in Waterloo, which is about an hour away outside of uh, Freetown, yeah. um, she recounted to me a story. I mean, she, she lost her husband, she lost her two kids. Uh, she used to live uh, about four hours away from the city in a place called Kenema, mm -hmm. in a village called Kenema. And uh, after she contracted Ebola herself, was taken to uh, the hospital. She survived, luckily. But when she went back to her village, she was threatened by some villagers because, uh, obviously, the stigma that is attached to having survived Ebola. So it's persist up till today. Absolutely. So yeah. do, not only do they have to suffer the, the, the loss, I mean, the, the, they, they lost their loved ones, uh, they lost any income that they were making, mm -hmm. um, but now they have to fear for their lives because... Exactly their lives are under threat. I mean, this is one case. I'm sure there, 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 are, several there, there, there are several others. Very quickly, we know that there's been a lot of money pouring uh, into those countries to help, especially these farmers and poor uh, villagers who survived. Uh, how's the progress? What are they telling you? So part, you part of uh, what we did in, uh, in, in Monrovia, we held a town hall meeting with uh, students, mm -hmm. government leaders, uh, and, and young entrepreneurs. And we were talking about how the, country's, uh, how the country is recovering. Yeah. And we, we did bring up the, the issue of money that is coming in or will come in, because yeah. remember last year we were mm -hmm. in the U, at the UN and they yeah. raised over $3 billion to yeah. help the three West African countries that were affected for their recovery plans. Uh, in Freetown, uh, when I spoke to, last year when I spoke to the government spokesperson, they told me they had handouts, cash handouts that were going out to villagers, to uh, low-income uh, yeah. families. In, in Monrovia, I did not get the sense that they're doing the same, but there's, uh, the, 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 the deputy uh, minister of health, uh, Tolbert Nyenshwa, told me that yeah. government is working to, to, to uh, help those people who were affected. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we did not get a feeling that the funds have come in yet or yeah. that they're coming in uh, uh, as much as we expected. You know, excellent reporting, Jackson, and we know that we can expect more Absolutely. from you in the coming weeks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Well, that's our viewers, uh, Jackson and Mungani. Now, it's time for a short break now. Still to come on Africa 54. A Norwegian startup's uh, outside-the-box solution for childhood isolation. We'll be right back.
great. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. They tell you what people are talking about. So for an in-depth look at the stories trending high on social media, turn to hashtag VOA. It's not your typical talk show. From politics to pop culture, hashtag VOA brings in the people leading the conversation, engages the audience, and gets answers to your questions. Hashtag VOA, smart talk for smart people. Welcome back to Africa 54. And now here's what's trending. A Norwegian startup company has developed a robot for use in classrooms, allowing seriously ill pupils to take part in lessons from their beds and even part in playtime with their friends. The Oslo-based firm No Isolation hopes to transform the lives of school children suffering long-term illnesses uh, who are often isolated during their recovery. The robot is placed on the desk of where the child usually sits or carried to the playground by friends. The child controls it through a tablet or smartphone via an app. The app allows the child to see the classroom, hear what's being said, contribute to lessons using their own voice, and decide which direction the robot is looking by moving its head. Well, next up, why are Iranian men walking taller than even before? A survey conducted by a group of scientists from the Imperial College London has studied the average height of 18-year-old men and women in 200 countries between 1914 and 2014. The results show that Iranian men have been shooting up during the last 100 years. The height of uh, Iranian men increased by an average of 16.5 centimeters. Finding clothes that fit has been ch a challenge. But now Iranian clothes uh, producers are beginning to manufacture tall sizes. Social media is helping too. An Instagram page called Iranian Tall is now an active group that brings tall men and women together. Well, and finally, uh, Macau has uh, been dubbed the Las Vegas of Asia. Gambling has been big business in the special administrative region of China, drawing millions of visitors and dollars every year. But gaming revenue has been falling for 26 months straight. China's Communist Party leaders want Macau, the only place in China where casino gambling is permitted, to give up its reliance on so-called VIP gamblers who often have been corrupt mainland Chinese government officials or executives at state-owned companies. Instead, they want more non-gaming attractions to lure middle-class families and help turn the city into a prominent Asian tourism destination with a more sustainable growth model. And that is what is trending today. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. For more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, Africa News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the morning today, Break Africa. That's between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. Welcome to the Voice of America's News Words. Here's a word you might have heard in medical stories. Chemotherapy. Until recently, the treatment all patients received was the same chemotherapy. Sometimes it helped, but sometimes it didn't. Researchers have been trying to come up with better treatments to shrink the tumors without affecting normal tissue or subjecting patients to the negative side effects of chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is medicine used by doctors to fight cancer and some mental disorders. Chemotherapy uses chemicals to kill cancer cells in a person's body. The chemicals sometimes are mixed in a liquid and injected into a person's blood. Now when you hear the word chemotherapy, 
you will know what this news word means.